Async is not fast, it is efficient, and async is not free. So I'm going to show you some bad code to demonstrate easy ways to break node that a lot of people don't actually think too much about. Um, first, factorials. Uh, so I'm calculating a whole bunch of factorials and running it through the numbers.map thing. A lot of people, for some odd reason, seem to think that uh, callback is magically async, which it's not. That will block your process. Yes, it, com it completes in about 100 milliseconds, so it doesn't seem too bad, but it kills my HTTP server, and I don't want that. Callbacks are not magically async. Uh, uh, a callback can execute asynchronously, but unless you specifically tell it to, it probably won't. It'll usually execute immediately. And if you don't, it just blocks. So you need to use the event loop. Let's make that async. So this is basically doing the same thing, but for each number it's using, uh, for each calculation it's using set immediate. So all of them are calculated individually as individual events. So my HTTP, my HTTP server works now, so everything's fine, right? My calculations are nice and speedy, but wait, my execution time tripled. That's not good. Async is not fast, it is efficient. To make code async, you queue it to the event loop to run later. If there's a lot in the queue, it might take a while to get to. And managing the queue, there's a lot of extra overhead to that. Um, for, for each event you create, there's a little bit of extra stuff that happens in the background. And if you do a lot of this, it's entirely possible that your little events are actually going to have more overhead from the management than what it's actually doing. So why would I use it then? Well, I'm sure most of you know that uh, async lets you shift the, well, lets the system shift the code around to execute it more, uh, more efficiently, use your idle time as the whole point of node. And in a blocking system, there's a lot of idle, idle time to reclaim. But uh, <coughs> smaller blocks are, uh, sm smaller blocks are easier to move without delaying other code. They, ru they run fairly quickly, but you make them too small. There's performance penalty. So we must dig deeper. Don't blindly wrap everything in set immediate. Consider batching. You, you want to narrow your code to smallest isolatable units that are like repeatable bits of code and benchmark how, how quickly this one piece of code is and start grouping them together and search for a balance. You want short blocking time without taking forever. So here's a little generic batch helper Give it an array and how many items from it you want to you want to run a calculation on, and function to do each of the calculations and another one to receive the result. Uh, it'll split it into chunks and do your hopefully fast calculations, and th this will allow your block time to be reduced without increasing total time too much. And the count lets you easily adjust the threshold. So let's try and run our now batched calculation. So I, I get decent overall execution time without major blocking. My HTTP server works fine and my processing is quick. This async thing is easier than I thought. Async is not free. As demonstrated, excessive asynchrony can get very slow. That small bit of overhead adds up and can interfere with other things even. 
So let's try another experiment. File caching. What do you think is wrong here? Let's try calling it. That looks sane, right? I'll just try and access my cacheable file and just print a little message saying I'm loading and tell me when I'm done. Seems to behave normally. So I'll try it again just to be sure. And wait a minute. It doesn't work quite right. It's printing that it's done before it even started loading. So you need to be consistent about how you work with the event loop. If, if you're, you know, many node devs uh, make a lot of functions that are what I like to call maybe async. So the first call uh, to the, cache, the cacheable file will hit the FS read file. And that'll go through node to libuv, and that'll be async. And so whatever called that, it's going to continue executing that stack, and it'll send that back eventually. When it completes, it'll call back. Uh, when you try and call it again, it, you didn't do anything to tell it that the cacheable branch needs to be evented, so it's not. It will not release the event loop. It'll interrupt the stack. It's not going to continue executing the stuff below. It's going to run your function immediately and then go back to it. And that can introduce weirdness. So let's give that another go. I wrapped it in a process.next tick. And now both paths are async. That's better. Um, <clears throat> so now either path will uh, always ex execute in the same way. It's pred predictable. It's good. So process.next tick. Uh, occurs before I.O. This is dangerous. This means that it can stall I.O. If, if you keep uh, queuing more next tick items, it could just stop I.O. from ever happening. Fortunately, we've kind of fixed that with max tick depth. After n recursions, node will puke and die. This is good. Failing spectacularly is better than failing silently. There's also set immediate. Set immediate occurs after I.O. events. Yes, the naming kind of sucks. Uh, because of the ordering, this can relatively safely uh, queue recursively. But years of bad practice have led us all to use next tick. Don't. Use set immediate. It's better. 99% less headaches, guaranteed. Uh, but what's this libuv thing? Well, to be honest, there's actually another way to queue events. Uh, the, first, the first two uh, queue events within the JavaScript virtual machine. This is only useful for events that will remain in JavaScript through their full life cycle. When you interface with native code, it's actually delegating to libuv, and it's going to go through a slightly different path. Uh, all the internal I.O. APIs use it, as do any native modules, like third-party native modules providing I.O. So how does it actually work? Uh, LibUV provides API normalization over several system event interfaces, ePoll, KQ, IOCP, and event ports. It routes I.O. requests from JavaScript side to libuv and to an internal thread pool from the main thread. And so you, you get all the, advantage, all the advantages of threaded I.O. without the hassle. When the I.O. returns, it'll call the native callback, which goes back to JavaScript. Uh, and the data is fed back either as blob response or stream, depending on what the interface is. So how does Node actually interact with it? Well, this is basically a rundown of the sequence of events that 
a code path will go through in libuv. Uh, from first starting node, it's going to bootstrap the C++ core, and then it's going to bootstrap the JavaScript module system, and then it's going to run your entry point if you gave it a file, or it might just go to the REPL if you didn't give it one. And any I.O. that is requested within that, it's going to push that to the thread pool. And it's just going to sit there. And then it's going to run any process.nexttick events. And anything from that may also get pushed to the thread pool. And then it's going to check and see if any of these I.O. requests have returned yet. And if something has, then give it back. And once the JavaScript that executed from that resolves, uh, it'll reach an idle state. And when the idle state is reached, it triggers set immediate callbacks. And again, uh, set immediate can trigger more I.O. or uh, anything from and any of the points where it says that uh, if I was requested to push into the thread pool, it pushes to go to the next frame, which it's not exactly a loop, but effectively it goes back to four, runs process.nexttick again, and it keeps going through this, but it's not doing like your typical kind of while loop. It's um, listening for system notifications to run the next step. Because uh, if, if you run a script and you like do, do a couple actions, like push in some process.nexttick events, all of those are going to get run through on that next tick. And then there's going to be nothing left in the JavaScript side for it to actually execute. And so there's no point in trying to loop over anything in there waiting for it to execute something because it's not possible. It has to receive a signal from somewhere to do something. So the only other possible origin is queued events. So it's, going to, it's just going to sit there doing nothing until the operating system says, I have I.O. from something. So do, some, do something with that I.O. and then return to your step through. Uh, so I'm going to show you some actual live demos of some of this. This is basically that first sample. And uh, I just added in some timing things to give you an idea of how much of a difference this actually makes. So OK, I have my first sample took about 99 milliseconds. It blocked for a full second. Second one, which use events for each individual thing took more than three times longer. Whereas the one that used batching took fairly close to what the first one took and didn't block long. You got like 22 millisecond blocks. That's not really that big of a deal. And this is demonstrating the other issue of, uh, oh, go back to the slide because it's not obvious. <coughs> That's my file caching. So that is running that in the first one, obviously. Loading and done, that makes sense. But then done and loading does not. So wrapping it in process.nextTick fixed it. Um, 
you should usually think about which which one you're actually using, though, um, because as I said before, process.nextTick does happen before I/O, so it will block. Um, it 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 will delay any I/O that might try and come back in. Ooh. I think that was it. Yes. Well, that apparently that was all I had. Thank you.